Well, this morning, uh, we're, uh, we're continuing our series. For those who are visitors or who are new, um, the, we just finished a series where we preached through the whole book of Revelation. So we went through the last day events, and now our next goal for this next year is to preach on evangelism. Amen. So we're going to be preaching through Acts. So before we get to Acts, we want, we're going, we've been going through the Great Commissions. So we went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and today we're at the final one that's found in Acts. And so this morning, we're looking at the Great Commission in Acts, and before we get dive into it, I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a close call? You know what I'm saying? Have someone that was just a little too close for comfort? Well, this morning, I want, I want to share a story with you real quick. I was little, I was about seven or eight, and does anybody here like to go four-wheeling? Any, any four-wheelers here? Well, when I was little, my, my grandma lived in Jefferson, and that's East Texas, out in the country. It was perfect. And she had two four-wheelers. So for me and my cousin, this was, this was heaven. We'd go and we'd drive around the four-wheelers, and one, one, one day, one morning, it had just rained, so you know, the, the grass was a little wet, and right in front of her house, she had a nice big yard. So my, my, my cousin and I, we were racing. This is always a bad story, but we were racing. And as we were racing, we went to hit the turn. And as I was hitting the turn, I began to drift. And as I began to drift, I hit a rock. And my four-wheeler flipped. And as the four-wheeler flipped, I went this way, and the four-wheelers came tumbling my way. And I remember as a kid, I landed on my back. And all of a sudden, as I was laying on my back, all of a sudden, my stomach hurt. And so as my stomach hurt, I went, oh. And as I did that, the wheels of the tire land right here. It pinched my shirt to the ground. I've never been more happy for an angel giving me a stomach ache. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but for me, that was a little too close for comfort. And this morning, I'd like to share with you a few pictures of some other moments that may be a little too close for comfort. I don't know if you guys can see that in the back, if we put down the lights a little bit. But you have a man in a rowboat and a big ship coming his way. A little too close for comfort. What about this one? <laughs> How'd you like to be that surfer? But we got another one. Whew. I'm sorry, I, I, wasn't, I hope you don't have a shark phobia. <laughs> but we got this one. Hmm. And I know we have some pilots in the audience. How about this? I don't know about you, but for me, that's a little too close for comfort. And you can turn back on the lights. But my friends, as we learn, the last days are coming, and Jesus is coming soon, amen? amen? And my friends, because of that, Jesus' is coming is too close for us to be comfort. It's too close for us to live comfortably. And my friends, in this last final commission, we see that the disciples had a lesson to learn that today we have to learn too. So before we dig into our Bibles, let us take a moment to pause and let's welcome in God's presence once again. Let's pray. Dimly Father, Lord, our God, our Savior, and our King, Lord, how wonderful you are. And Lord, as we're here this morning, for one purpose, to learn more about you and to praise you. Lord, I pray that you hide me behind the cross. May my words not be mine, but yours, Lord. And Lord, as we leave this room, may we have your presence and the knowledge of you in our hearts and on our minds. We love you, Lord, and thank you so much for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. amen. So this morning, if you brought your Bibles, please join me in Acts chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And here we see the final commission given to the disciples. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 So God's word says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote ab about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the, the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. 
He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them of the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he, had ta he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who had been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. My friends, that's our promise. That's our hope. That Jesus didn't just leave us here on this earth, but that he's coming soon. And right now, he's preparing a place for you and for me. But I, I want you guys to open up your Bibles again, and I want you to go to verse 7 with me. And I want you to read verse 7 with me one more time. It says, and Jesus said to them, oh, no, no, sorry, I'm sorry, verse 6. Go back one more verse. And it says, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And you know, as I was reading this in prep, and preparing for the sermon, I read it and I was like, what? Jesus' best friends, who had been with him for three years, didn't get his mission. They didn't get it. And as I began to think about it, I began to wonder, why didn't they get it? And because you see, during the time, the Israelites, or the Jews, they thought that they were God's special people. They thought that they had the truth to salvation. And even more, if you go to John 4, verse 22 with me, Jesus himself says, in John 4, chapter 4, verse 22, it says, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. My friends, do the Jews thought they had it all. They had salvation. They had the truth. But you know what's interesting? Even though they had the truth, when truth came in flesh, they rejected and murdered him. And even now, as Jesus is giving them the final commission, they are still wondering, Jesus, when are you going to create your kingdom? When are you going to make Israel the top dog? When are you going to destroy uh, the Roman Empire? What's so interesting is that Jesus, he doesn't rebuke them. He said, it's not for you to know the time. Because you see, even the disciples, before they could go and tell the world about Jesus, had to be converted. And if you look, the next verse, it says, then, the Holy, then you will receive the Holy Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses. You know, and as I was reading about this, and as I was thinking about the Jews, who they had the truth, they had the sanctuary, they knew about Jesus, their blessed hope. They, their whole economic structure was on Jesus, but yet when he came, they missed it. And I couldn't help but think, as I looked at the Jews, that, my friends, are we like them? Because hear me out. We have the truth, amen? Do you guys believe we have the truth? Amen. I believe we have the truth, or I want to be a pastor. We have the truth, but could it be that we became so headstrong that we forgot to become heartstrong? Yes. Listen to me. Could it be that we have the knowledge of God, but we never actually experienced Him in, his, in our lives? If you have your bulletin, I'd like you to take it out. There's a, there's a, and I'd like us to read the meditation together. It's found in the book, Humble Heroes, 
page 312. So if you have your bulletin, please take it out. And it says, Jesus worked to inspire, to inspire his disciples with the joy and the hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because the Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts he could ask from the Father for his people. God would give the Spirit to rejuvenate us. Without this, the sacrifice of Christ would not have, been, would not have accomplished its purpose. The power of evil had been strengthened for centuries, and the submission of men and women to the satanic um, captivity was amazing. They could resist sin and overcome it only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with all divine power. The Spirit makes effective what the world's Redeemer worked out. The Spirit makes the heart pure. Christ has given his spirit to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to imprint his own character on his church. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is at stake in his people, in his people's perfection of character. My friends, Christ in God's honor is resting on his church. And my friends, if we have all the head knowledge, but if our hearts are not committed, we miss the whole thing. I want to share with you a statistic that I just recently learned. Um, there's a mega church in Houston, uh, Joel Olstein. Are you guys familiar with that? Well, his church has 30,000 members, okay? 30,000 members. And from, that, and from this last year, that mega church, <clears throat> with their revenue, brought in $70 million. Now I want to share another statistic with you. The Texas Conference has 54,000 members. And guess how much income this year they brought in? $42 million. My friends, I believe somewhere in a corner, the devil is looking at us and laughing. Because you see, some people have the commitment, but not the truth. While we have the truth, but not the commitment. One more statistic. I recently found out that if only 60% of Adventists in the Texas Conference paid their tithe, that Adventist education would be free. That would be like public school. My friends, the problem today isn't the knowledge. We have the truth. The problem is a heart problem. Amen. Now I want you to go back to Acts with me. To verse 6, and it says, But you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God has called us to be his witnesses. And I have a question for you. What is a witness? A witness is someone who expresses what they experienced, what they saw, where they were at, to a judge, right? To a court. They tell what they experienced. I have a question for you. Would you bring up an informant for your case? If you got in a traffic, if you got a, a, a traffic accident or a car accident and someone hit you, would you want to have someone who comes up and says, well, you know, Bill Joe heard from Sue J, who, who heard from Susie, that this is what happened. Would you want that to be in court with you? No. No, you want someone who saw it, who witnessed it, who heard it, who smelled it. You want someone who was there. And my friends, the problem is there are too many informants of Christianity and not, too many, and not enough witnesses of Christianity. 
What's interesting is the word for witness in Greek is martyros, which is the word is which is the word that we get martyr. So to be God's witnesses, we have to be God's martyrs. And you know, so when I was, you know, it kind of changes the whole way. You know, when you're little, you're like, you tell little kids, hey, you got to be a witness for Jesus. What do we say? You have to be a martyr for Jesus? And what's so interesting is so many times I remember when I was little, you know, people would say, you know, would you die for Jesus? You know, you hear the scenario, if a gunner came in and said, if you love Jesus, I'm going to shoot you. But if you say you don't love Jesus, I won't shoot you. Have you guys ever heard that scenario? My question for you is, I remember when I was little, I was like, yes, I'd take a bullet for him. But my question for you is, would you die to comfort for Jesus? Would you change the way you live for Jesus? Because you see, from my own experience, I would go out and I'd go feed the homeless. You know, when you feed the homeless, you put on like that, that mask. You know, and you're out there like, oh, please, you know, Jesus loves you so much. Can I pray with you? And we would be there, and we'd be ministering for them, we'd be quoting Bible scriptures to them, but something would happen. You see, after it was sundown, we'd go to CC's. Oh, we go to CC's. I love CC's. We go to CC's. And it was interesting because when we went to CC's, the same youth group that was out there ministering became a whole different, whole different group. And what, was, and what scares me is I, I don't know what happened if those same homeless people saw us in CC's. What would they think? Because when we were there, we were joking, we were, saying, we were talking about inappropriate things, we were just joking around having a good time. We were totally different people than who we were, out, who we were when we were out. Because you see, the problem is we have too many informants who know about Jesus, who know what Doug Batchelor says about Jesus, but who have never experienced God's life-changing power in their lives. And this morning, I want to share two stories of people who had Jesus transform their lives. But before that, I want us to go back to our text. <clears throat> and Jesus said, You are my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And I want us to take us a moment and think about what the disciples must have thought when they heard that. You know, he's like, you're my witnesses in Jerusalem. They're like, yeah! But then he says, Samaria. And then he says, to the ends of the earth. And you see, the Jews, they thought salvation was just for them. And they're like, you want us to go out and talk to Gentiles? But this morning, I want to share a story with you. So if you go with me to Matthew 15, verses 21 and 28. Matthew 15, verses 21 and 28. And my, my Bible has it headed as the faith of a Canaanite woman. And in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, it says, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terrible, terribly from a demon possession. But look at this. In verse 23, it says, But Jesus did not answer a word. And I want you to imagine what the disciples were thinking. You can see the disciples, they, they don't really like the Canaanites. Because if you, if you remember with David, that's who they battled all the time. So they're like, yes, yes, Jesus is on our side. You know, and he's like, yeah, yeah, don't, don't talk to her. And look, look what he, they say to him. And it says that they urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. The disciples are like, yeah, yeah, get rid of her. Get rid of her. We don't want her following us. Get rid of her. But I want you to see what Jesus says. He answered and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And as the di disciples heard that, they're like, yes, yes. And the woman came and she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. 
I want to take a moment here. And if you go back to verse 22, her first, she first said, son of David. Now, son of David was a political term. That's saying that Jesus was to be the next one on David's throne. So first she comes to him as a political leader. But here we see that she comes to him as Lord. And she says, Lord, help me. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Now, what's interesting about this, that during this time, dogs was, probably, was, the, worst, was the worst insult you could give to someone. That's why later, when the Christians, when the Christian movement's beginning, the Jews call the Christians, you Christian dogs. Because you see, for dogs, you know, it's not like <clears throat> when Mr. Bullock, all the cute puppies. The dogs were known to be scavengers, to be unclean, to have diseases. So to call someone a dog was one of the worst things you could say. But what's interesting here is that the word in Greek that Jesus has used for dogs isn't the scavenger dog, but it's little dog. And what's interesting is saying, if we read it, it says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their, to their little dogs. And the Canaanite being a Greek, she says, yes, Lord, she said, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Two things. I wonder what the disciples thought of that. You know? Because the disciples in the beginning were like, yes, 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 get rid of her. But in the end, what does Jesus do? He heals her. But then two, can you see what takes place in this woman's life? First, she's coming to him as a political leader, but then it says she went down before on her knees and said, Lord, help me. My friends, when was the last time we got down on our knees and said, Lord, help me? And I want to tell you something. If the Lord will help a little dog, how much more will he help a daughter or a son? So my friends, when you are in that moment where there, it looks like there's no answer, when you're in that moment where you don't know what you're going to do, if you go down to your knees and say, Lord, help me, he will always be there for you. Now, second story, because it said to the ends of the earth, and then it says Samaria. Now, who were the Samaritans? Who, what, what was Samaria? If you go to 2 Kings, going back to the Old Testament, if you go to 2 Kings, 2 Kings, verse 6, or 2 Kings, Chapter 17, verses 6, and then we're also going to read verse 24. So 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 6, and verse 24. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 And God's word says, In the ninth year of uh, Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in uh, Hala, in the, in, the Gozen, uh, in the Gozen, on the Habar River, and in the town of the Medes. And then skipping over to verse 24, it says, The king of Syria brought people from Babylon, Akutha, uh, Ava, uh, Hamath, and Shav, Shaharim, sorry, hard words, and, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. So what happened was that the Samaritans, that this was the northern kingdom of Israel, they had turned their back on God. So God allowed for the Assyrian Empire to take them over. And as was tradition at the time, they would go in and they go and scatter the people. They would deport them all over to different places. The reason is because if they kept them together, they might try to fight back. So they scatter them all, but you see some were left in Samaria. And those who were left married 
these other people. And for the Jews, this was a no-no because they are God's people. They have to keep pure. And if you go with me to John chapter 4, John chapter 4. Mm-mm. John chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to see Jesus' first encounter with a Samaritan woman. And in John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. I want to stop here. So the way it was, was from Galilee to Judea. Samaria was in the middle. Okay? So to go through, the quickest way would go right through Samaria, it would take about three days, okay? So about three days. But most Jews didn't want to even talk to Samaritans so much that they'd go all the way around, which was a rougher, steeper mountain pass that would take six days to get to point A to point B. But let's keep reading. And so we're in verse 4, and it says, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So the Jacob's well is, on, is in the middle of a fork. So there's a fork on the road, and Jacob's well is in the middle. And Sychar is actually a mile and a half from this well. And from when it says the sixth hour, this means that it was, it was noonday. And to keep in mind that Sychar had its own well, right outside the city. So let's continue. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and, you, and, a Samar- and, a, and I am a Samaritan woman? How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now I want to I want to add something else. Not only did Jesus not talk to Samaritans, but Jesus was a teacher. He was called rabbi. And during the time, rabbis would even talk to women in public. So, for example, if a rabbi was out with his daughter and his wife, he wouldn't talk to them. Even more, there was something called bleeding and bruised rabbis who would even look at women in public. So say a rabbi's walking this way and a woman's walking this way, they would close their eyes, and many times they'd hit walls, run into cards, run into people, and that's why they're called the, the bleeding and bruised rabbis. But yet, with all this said, Jesus talks to her. In verse 10 it says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. And I want to skip down to verse 15 for the sake of time. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and, <clears throat> and have to keep coming here a mile and a half to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have five husbands, and the man that you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. So how she has five husbands, we don't know. Could it have been from death? from sexual immorality, or maybe it could be because during that time, a man could give a woman a divorce if she burned a mill, if she, if she got less pleasing to the eyes. So how she's now with five men, we don't know. But what we do know is that no matter what happened, we have a woman here who is broken, who's been used, and who's looking for love. And then she meets 
the seventh man, Jesus Christ, who shows her what true love is like. And in verse 19, <clears throat> verse 19, she's, uh, verse 19, she says, <clears throat> Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our father worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on a mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship, and we read this before, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of, wor of worshipers the Father seeks. And I want to stop here. Do you see the two elements? In spirit and in truth. My friend, in the Christian walk, just knowing the 28 doctrines, just knowing when to say amen is not enough. If you don't have the Holy Spirit working in your life, transforming your life, you miss the whole big picture. And finally, skipping ahead to verse uh, 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am who you speak of. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asks, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her wire jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I've ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then came out of the town and made their way to him. My friends, there are people in this world that are hungry and are thirsting for Jesus. And my friends, we have the holy, we, not, we have the living water. But my question is, how are we when people come to us? Are we like the disciples who are, who are like, Jesus, why are you talking to him? No, 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 keep, keep him away. Or are we like Jesus who says, come to me, all who is thirsty. Come to me, who, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. My friends, I believe that there are people in other religions, there are people in other countries, there are people who are looking for Jesus, are looking for this truth that we have. My question is, are we sharing it with them? Are we sharing the water, that, the, the living water that we have? My final point is, and this is to close. My final point is the disciples were comfortable in Jerusalem. They were comfortable telling the people around them about Jesus, but they weren't comfortable about telling the rest of the world about Jesus. And as I look at this, I think, you know, today I think it's the reverse opposite. I think for us, Jerusalem, our hometown, our friends, our family is too close for comfort. Because you see, we're okay with going on the mission trips. We're okay with giving water to the homeless. We're okay with going out and doing outreach. But what happens when we get back home? Because you see, in Christianity today, we have begun to be hypocrites. But before I say that, you've got to understand what a hypocrite is because Jesus made up this world, word. Did you know that? Because you see, a hypocrite during the time was an actor who would wear different masks so that they could play in different acts of the play, be different characters. And it's funny because, I mean, just imagine if you went to a play and you liked it, you were like, man, you were great. You were a great hypocrite. <laughs> but you see, today, we become hypocrites. But because we have our Sabbath mask, and then we have the rest of the week mask. And you see, the reason we don't have people flooding through our doors, the reason people think that Christians are hypocrites is because we wear masks. And this morning, I want to share a quote with you. It's by Gandhi. 
And he says, I liked your Christ. I do not like your Christian. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. My friends, when we leave these doors, who are we? My prayer is that we be Christians. To close, I want to share a story with you. And the story is, is written by Max Berhim, who, who called it the happy hypocrite, a fairy tale for a tired gentleman. And the story goes like this. George Lord had led a wasteful life. Greed, gambling, superficial relationships, broken promises to women, too much alcohol. He's having a lavish meal with his lover when he sees a young, innocent woman and promptly falls in love. He desperately wants to marry her, but she has vowed only to marry a man with the face of a saint. Not long after, not long after he passes by a mask sto- a shop and he has the owner create a lifelike wax, a mask that cr- uh, creates precisely the image he is hoping for. He returns to the woman who has won his heart. He proposes and she accepts. That moment marks the beginning of a moral conversion. He signs the wedding certificate, George Heaven. He donates much of his money to the poor. He repays everyone he had cheated. He is humble before the people whom he had never noticed before. He enters into the way of a life of a saint. Sometime later, his old, letter, his old lover sees him and comes to unmask him before his wife. A struggle ensues, his mask is tossed to the ground, and his old lover laughs in triumph. He must turn and face his wife. But when he does, he is shocked by her question, why did you have a mask created that look precisely like your continents, precisely like how you looked. While he had entered into the way of a saint, an unknown and unseen power had begun at work. He had grown into his face. My friends, What mask are we wearing? My friends, this world doesn't need Christians who are Christians at church but not out in the workplace, who are Christians at church but not Christians in the home. And my friends, the only way, the only way that we can be like Jesus is by following the example of Jesus. I want you to turn to one last Bible verse with me, found in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 16 and 18. And this, and, this, and this afternoon, I'm going to read out of the Message Bible, just because I like the way it says. It says, in verse 16, it says, Whenever, though they turned to face God, as Moses did, God, God removed the veil, and, and there they are, face to face. This, they suddenly recognized that God is a living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it all, all of us, nothing between us and God, our face shining with brightness of his. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives are gradually become brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. My friends, as we are in the presence of God, he will change our life. Two weeks ago, I made a challenge for you to read your Bible, to pray every day, and to grow, grow, grow. My friends, today I have another challenge for you. 
And that challenge is not to just merely read your Bible, but to be in the presence of Jesus. How long is that going to take? An evangelist named Mark Finley said, as long as it takes to know that you were with Jesus. So my friends, as you're reading your Bible, my challenge for you is to not leave until you know without a shadow of doubt that you have been with Jesus. And as a church, as, as we continue to be with Jesus, he will mold and he will recreate us into his own image for his glory. As a church, may we represent Jesus in all we do. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, Lord, our God, our Savior, and our King, we love you so much. And Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Our prayer is that this week, that we'll be in your presence and that you will transform our lives. May we never wear a mask anymore. Lord, we love you and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.